move is, is for that. Um, I suppose at a city level in Exeter particularly, absolutely great that there's LTNs and um, which are um, low traffic neighbourhoods being introduced, but is there, like in cities like Bristol, for instance, introducing clean air zones, does the city need to go further and be bolder in, in their moves um, in, in specifically relating to transport? So I think it's a really great question. I've been living with that. And one of the things when you're in a non-politically sensitive post, you have to watch what you say. Yeah? So the reality is, if you take net zero 2030 as a target date, and you plot the graph linear, what we need to do on transport is a revolution in cycling and walking. And that needs both a stick policy, which other cities are doing, and massive investment as a carrot to give you safe cycling networks and so forth. The reality is you have choices. There are priorities and there are choices. And cities have these choices. And politicians have to make those choices, but they need support. So I've been working very closely with political leaders, and I can tell you it can be a very lonely place for them. Because what they may want to do is not what comes through correspondence. Because my experience is, and I love the business community, and you know where, am I, where my uh, priorities have been. Business don't write letters. I never see businesses put their head above the parapet and say, you know what, what the council's doing on this is good, you should do it. No, it tends not to happen. And I understand it, but it's the reality. So what you get are the letters that are negative. We have choices as a society. My view is that the city centre should be entirely pedestrianised and we should work to remove the multi-storey car parks from the historic core. And you just look up at the city centre vision 2011 plan, have a look at it, the principles are there. Our local plan before that said we would have a pedestrianised city centre. The challenges we got, many of the businesses require a travel to work area for their labour market and they are concerned, will our workers be able to come in? Not only that, will the businesses continue to thrive if people can't get into the centre, which requires massive investment in transport, public transport, buses, trains, all those things. So it needs leadership to do both. The reality is, though, and this is a point that I was trying to make, is, is it all about a binary, yes, we succeed, or we failed, if we don't get to 2030? Or do we create an environment where we try innovation, we learn from our interventions, and you create an atmosphere, we are trying lots of things. And that in itself is of value, but it also needs you to be really honest with it. So we might try all kinds of transport initiatives, and some of it will stick, some of it won't. But if national government, others recognize this is the place to try it, then that itself. We've tried on many things, uh, electric buses, uh, we've made bids, government tends to put the money into traditional places and it still goes there. Um, so the bottom line is, a lot of waffle, very sorry. We need to do more, absolutely a hell of a lot more, a step change more in walking and cycling and investment in transport and from the, those who are the best in transport, we're not there. But at the same time, hard work, delivered massive investment in rail infrastructure in the city, and there has been lots of work since COVID to make intervention in this space. So um, I'm not gonna have a, a pop at anybody. I think they've done a lot of good work. Thank you. Um, I, I, I don't think um, words can describe just what an inspirational and visionary leader Kareem has been and, and what a huge loss Kareem you'll be to, to the city. I know you'll continue to do um, lots of interesting stuff locally, but um, we wish you the very, very best. And thank you so much for, for taking the time out this morning to um, share your thoughts with us. Um, and now we're going to move to a completely different space.
Um, I think last week, well, I know last week I was at a Tech Extra event where, where one of um, Tim's colleagues was there, and he was talking about risk sausages. Risk sausages. Risk yeah. sausages. So um, <laughs> this is the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, local business, um, spin out from the university. It is, yeah. Um, based, out, based down at the key, um, a really exciting deep thinking or deep, deep tech um, startup organization and, and some really interesting stuff that you're doing around um, Net Zero and supporting it. So um, over to you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we're going on slides, right. Okay, yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I had a, a nightmare this morning because I actually split my trousers out and quickly sew them up, so luckily you're not getting a view that you don't want to see. Um, and thanks to the organisers, particularly Rachel, corralling a professor to get slides in is like herding cats, so well done, Rachel. Um, so, yeah, I'm here, so I'm a professor at the university in AI and machine learning, uh, and, but here I'm talking to you about DigiLab. DigiLab is a spin-out. I'm co-founder and CTO of DigiLab. And really what I want to talk about is the pivotal role digital twins can play in our journey to net zero. So if you don't know what a digital twin is, I'm going to give you my version of a digital twin so you'll learn. Um, I think it's a really important area about how we take models and data together and then we make actionable decisions. Often the people that make the decisions aren't professors in mass. They're intelligent people which are maybe geographers, they may be... Uh, historians or maybe lawyers uh, and from their training and background. So how we present data to them in an unbiased way so they can make good decisions about our future is essential. So DigiLab, as we said, it's a spin out of Exeter University. Um, it's a proud Exeter business based down at the Quay, at the top floor of the Generator Club. Um, it's what's called an agile deep tech company. Um, but what our aim is to be is a trusted partner to industry leaders to help them make actionable decisions, and we do this through digital twin solutions. One of the big motivators for me setting up this business is I really care about sustainability, and I'm good at AI. And so it's like, what can I do to make a difference? And that was really starting a company. Uh, so we're a collection of techies and environmental geeks. Um, come down to the key, have coffee with us. We love to talk to people. It's founded on two principles, which Karim highlighted. It's about people and planet, right? We want a working environment people love, uh, but also we want to do AI projects for sustainability and that route to net zero. So we're proudly the first uh, four-day week company, uh, uh, tech company uh, in the Southwest, which is a real. Uh, we work with lots of different people, uh, from air traffic control to Southwest Water, Airbus, um, particularly with UKAA around fusion. I'll talk a bit about that. Um, but primarily what we want to do is we want to provide a platform for industry to be able to exploit the latest and greatest in machine learning. And we call it democratizing digital twins, so making it easy to extract value from this new technology. The other thing that we really realize in speaking to our industries, our customers, is they can't hire talent in AI quick enough. It isn't out there. It's not accessible or it's extremely expensive. So next month we are, we're launching something called the DigiLab Academy, Different from the university, which probably focuses on theoretical groundings, what we want to create is AI practitioners. We call it people that do AI in the wild. And we think this is an essential skill to upskill your businesses so that you can make the most out of this new technology. Um, so what is a digital twin? So, you know, academically I would say it's a st statistically calibrated simulation of physical, uh, societal or engineering systems. What that means is it's essentially a digital replica of a complicated system. And why it's really important is that these are really complicated systems. So take Exeter City, for example. There's an intricate link between how we consume energy, how we uh, move around in transport, air pollution, how the economy thrives. And whilst we might feel we know how those uh, are in isolation, how they interact is extremely complicated. A digital twin brings models and data together to help you optioneer or play what-if scenarios about how influences or changes in policy might affect that system in a complicated way. The really important thing is data is dirty in the sense that it's, it's uh, not the whole picture. Models are mathematical constructions, so they're not right. So with it comes uncertainty. What we really care about is not providing you with the answer, but a distribution of possible answers which can result from your opinion. And we believe fundamentally that's what decisioners need to make when understanding risk. Um, another thing is, a digital twin is meant to be a visual output for us. 
Um, if you have charts numbers, they're very difficult to interpret. So you need information to be provided to decision makers, which is easily accessible, digestible, which helps them make better decisions. So three areas that I particularly work in. Fusion is really exciting. It's turning from science fiction to an engineering challenge now. And being the decisions that need to be made about how that can hit our grid are, are fundamental to our future in a very sustainable, clean way of energy. Uh, we're working with UKAEA and a load of uh, uh, fusion startups, so really exciting area. Electric vi uh, aircraft sound crazy, uh, but we're working with uh, companies like Vertical for air taxis about the future of clean air mobility. And then the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see an example of um, air pollution in Lausanne in, in Switzerland. But really understanding the intricate connection between uh, traffic and air pollution is, is really uh, fundamental. Um, so to talk about a project that we've been funded by Innovate, and I know Andy and Ben are in the audience, so this is no credit for myself. It's, it, this is their work. I'm just the, the person presenting it. But we've uh, been funded to start creating something called Twin City, which is going to be a digital Exeter. Um, and the first thing that we're actually looking at is the, the understanding urban solar capacity. Uh, and so this is this intricate demand between supply of uh, uh, electrical energy or solar energy and also how we use it. Because the challenge with solar is obviously it peaks in different times of uh, the year, peaks in different times of the day. It's kind of like use it, store it or lose it strategy and it's quite complicated. So the first thing that we've been looking at is we've built a com computer vision model which can quickly audit a city and highlight all the rooftops, the pictures of it uh, from open LIDAR data. And then we build, so in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see the uh, distribution of energy production on a typical day. So what this enables us to do is to do a fast audit of a city to actually just understand what is the urban solar capacity capable in that city. Um, and then we need to start thinking with stakeholders, so get in touch if you're interested, how will we build that into making a solution which is accessible? Like how do we share energy? How do we make a local market for energy where we can share and evenly use? Like if we're creating a lot of solar, Marsh Barton, perfect example of that. You could create a lot of solar on the rooftops in Marsh Barton, but you've got to use it. So how do we redistribute energy locally and make the most of this opportunity? As I highlighted on the last stage, the other area that we're really going to try and hit is about air pollution and traffic. I'm a runner. I don't like breathing in fumes. Uh, I care about my children going to school and breathing fumes. Um, I'd love to see exactly that, uh, uh, a completely pedestrian center, but um, let's provide the evidence to make the case and support that, that decision making. So last slide, um, what I'd like to really encourage is the idea that instead of doing things on gut feeling, we do it driven by data. So I call this data-driven intelligence. So what are the optimal policies to get X to zero? Can we play the what-if scenarios which let us make a more informed decision about how we do that? Um, so in our case, what is the urban capacity of solar in, in Exeter? Is it a viable option? How far does it get us? You know, if we invest now and we subsidize it, could we reach the, uh, the way? Would it have a big impact or wouldn't it have a big impact? Really help people make strategic high-level decisions about our strategy. Is it economically viable? Because ultimately, this has to come down, down to viability. We know that not driving is the easiest way to reduce air pollution. We know that stick solar everywhere and it will be renewable. But does it sing? Like, economically, it has to work. These are complicated questions, multiple sources of data and model that we can't help, help to understand. And we need help understanding it through these techniques. And so I propose that you know, digital twin solutions will be the future about how people make decisions in complicated engineering systems. And it would be amazing if Exeter could trailblaze the uptake of that technology and be part of that. To the extent that we so believe in this, that we would like, uh, to, we're going to make the platform open for shared information to the public, uh, and so that we can really democratize the use of these techniques. Uh, I finish with, we have a joke in DigiLab that we convert coffee into code, which has an impact. But if you want to come and join us with co uh, for coffee, no code required, then please get in touch. I'd, we like talking to people. Thank you.
Um, absolutely fantastic. And, and the, yeah, this idea of the, the digital twin, which I've you know, started to read about over the last few years, and then looking at, you know, plotting that in, in Exeter and looking at the solar, it's, it's just amazing. A question from me, in terms of a project like that, to go from start through to a place where you've got some data that you could share with the likes of Kareem or, or other people, how long does that take and what size team do you need so, to get that going? I mean, ex uh, we started six months ago yeah. as a business. Uh, we've gone from one to 17 people on to 24 people. Like, um, but th this project, like Andy is a wizard in the audience around deep learning. And that model actually only probably took him a week to, to identify the rooftops. And most of it was done by computer training. So we have the techniques, but they're complicated. I mean, Andy's very highly skilled, but we need to exploit people like Andy, yeah. right? Not in a bad way, but like his brain, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and so the idea of having an accessible platform allows us to distill easy ways which you could do that uh, as, you know, as an interested engineer, as an environmental scientist to exploit our our knowledge around that, so yes, it's pretty fabulous. easy. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, absolutely. Any question from the audience? We've got time for one question. We've got a question from Rob. Hello. Um, hi, Rob Bosworth from Exeter College. I thought I was brilliant. Thanks ever so much. Really inspirational. Thank totally you. ties into what Cream was talking about. Really interested in the academy, so I could come and have a chat with you about that at the coffee, if that's all right. My question is, um, I see a lot of kind of startups kind of talking about the AI and this kind of offer. Um, obviously, you've got some innovate funded. You've got to get through the valley of death and turn it into a commercial project uh, and product. What's your USP? So, I didn't know when I started, and I did the business the opposite way. Often, you come up with a product which you want to sell, and then you get funding from in, in, investors, and then and then you and then you try and make it commercial. We did it the other way around. So we went and said, we're talented in AI. We care about sustainability. What will you pay us to do? Is, is the strategy. Uh, we, we got a big hook with UK AEA that they have huge uncertainty around how do you put fusion on the grid, and we got a key, a key hook clients. What we really realized is AI, the traditional AI, like your Amazon AI, has huge amounts of data. Uh, they collect data on how we interact with it. That's kind of sorted in about how you do that in, in terms of methodology. What they don't answer is the fact, well, we don't have a fusion reactor, so you have no data. So we have simulations, so, so what do you do? So uniquely, our methods really rely on noisy, dirty data where there's huge uncertainty. And we, uh, my background is, is in, boringly as a Bayesian statistician, but what that really means to an end user is I don't care about giving you an answer, I care about giving you the possible range of outcomes that might happen. And I think that's the most important thing when you're making decisions with uncertainty, limited data, noisy data. And so that's that's core of our product. Yeah. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Isn't it just fabulous, though, to know that there's that passion and this expertise that's coming out of the university and then living amongst us locally, working, creating jobs, and and and, and helping to shape the future, you know, in a really positive way. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Phil. Um, Phil joins us from Horley. Um, Different subject. So, so Phil is a, as I turn my notes over, is an associate electrical design engineer. I needed to get that right because I knew I wouldn't quite get that right. Um, and Phil, you're going to talk to us about the electrification of, of, of the national grid and what you're doing in, in order to support some, some of that activity. All right, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is very strange for me. I've, I've not done a, a, a talk of this size, so if I fall over, don't worry. <laughs> Um, so, let's get to the first slide. Okay. So, obviously, I'm Philip Cottingham. Um, I'm from a company called Hawley. They're UK based, um, and we have offices in both Exeter and Plymouth. And Steve, who's around here somewhere, there you are, Steve. He's the, uh, he's the main, main honcho in, uh, in, in Exeter. So, um, that's, the, that's the big plug done. Okay. So, I wanted to talk about some of the, the, the two main challenges um, for, that we're seeing uh, for both ourselves and customers for reaching net zero. Um, it kind of ties in a little bit with the DigiLabs stuff as well, because quite often it's all about information and data. So, um, apologies, handwritten notes. So with environmental concerns, there's a drive to reach net zero for the majority of our customers before, before 2035, or at least have a roadmap 
uh, in place. So this move will have the effect of increasing energy consumption by displacing fossil fuels within electrification. Um, so I, I mean things like air source heat pumps, electric uh, boilers for kind of direct swap outs and things like that. A lot of that depends on um, building structure and materials. Um, so we, we, one of the things we need to manage is the grid itself, because as you might have seen the, the local news and things like that, the, the grid is under a little bit of strain at the moment um, before we even start stepping into our kind of net zero roadmaps. So at the moment, adding capacity for a lot of, uh, for a lot of industries isn't really, um, isn't really a, a, the short-term ch short answer. So from some of, the, some of the work we've been doing so far, I mean, we've been doing a lot of work with Exeter University and do a lot of work with data centers and things like that. We, with this move towards electrification, we're seeing a 30 to 50% increase um, in, in capacity. And obviously, again, going back to the university or the hospitals or something like that, you've got those big, big energy sites already and you're adding 30 to 50%, that becomes a bit of a problem um, for a lot of the other industries around. So to deal with that, we've got to look at some uh, unconventional design philosophies. Um, within this talk, I've not really, a lot really struck on EV charging because it's, it's one of the systems, although it's out there in the news quite a lot um, as a concern for the grid, to be honest, you can manage it quite easily with charging, uh, charging management systems. Um, so we're not too concerned with that. Um, so just to step back a little bit to explain the grid. Don't worry, I'm going to keep this fairly high level. <laughs> okay, so some of you drop off to sleep. So this is our, you know, kind of our, our standard structure of, the, of, the, of a grid system. I don't know if you've seen it before. You've got your power generation, your 400 kV, 275 kV kilovolt lines uh, for transmission that go to your primary transformers where your DNO, which is the district network operator, okay? Then you've got your bulk, bulk distribution, 33 and 11 kV, okay? Just to kind of give you a bit of a, an idea how that looks. So this next slide, it looks like it's got the measles, but it hasn't. So this is, this is a, 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 a quick snapshot, a heat map of the southwest area from the national grid. Okay, now the big spots, um, especially the red ones, indicate those primary substations, those 132 kV substations the DNO are having to deal with. Now the red, the red indicates you've got less than 10% capacity. Now this, this heat map was taken from two weeks ago. So already before we've even started stepping into these targets, we're at 10% capacity in the primaries. The smaller spots indicate the, the, bulk, the bulk loads, and you've got more green dotted around, but in the end, it's the primaries that restrict that, okay? So, you know, if you've got, again, going back to university, going back to um, hospitals, going back to big industry in the area, you've got these restrictions that are already there on the grid, and a lot of these primary substations will take years to develop um, and try and, get, um, try and get that capacity back. So. We need to look at things differently, as, as I said before. So this is a, a typical load profile from a university campus. It could be anywhere. It's that typical kind of like everybody starts come, turning up to work, half six, quite early. Um, energy, st energy usage starts going up and then starts to drop off towards half six at night. The residential complexes will be obviously different. It would be peaks in the morning, peaks in the evening, okay, with a fairly flat profile during the day and during the night. So what we need to try and do is develop, we, you know, we're used to designing in the way we look at maximum demand. We might apply diversity, you know, somebody's not using this thing all the time and it might not use as much as the nameplate says on the, on the item, things like that. Is everybody still with me? We, no, nobody's fallen asleep yet. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, so we need to look at that differently, okay? We need to look at how we can move, bring that load profile down a little bit and how we can move it out and how we can design for that, knowing the fact that the capacity isn't going to be there. You know, we, it's not just a matter of slamp it, uh, slapping like 20, 20 MVA on, uh, on our demand capacity. So, things that you may have seen. Obviously, we've talked a lot about PV. Wind is out there. And there's, there's been quite a lot about battery storage. Um, um, so the battery storage for us is key, more so than PV and wind, because battery storage is predictable energy. You know, you know, when you, can, you know when, when you can charge it up you know, you, when you can discharge, whereas PV and wind are a little bit unreliable in that respect. So we can look at battery storage across um, a private network, and this is what we're kind of coming to a little bit more, is using private high-voltage networks rather than low-voltage systems, which means that you can transport that, that usable battery energy across the site effectively using 
PV and wind power to, to, to push into the battery. Hope, hopefully, we're, um, everybody's still with me. Okay. So we, it's kind of, it, t it tends to be called load lopping, where we can move those peaks, flatten it out, move it to different areas. The other thing we can do is obviously using control systems like Digilabs, things like that. You can look at different times of day. So for instance, I'm using air source heat pump, I can just do like a night setback. Set it back a few degrees and just keep that building nice and warm and it's just a small ramp up in the morning where people start to arrive. Are we doing that? Okay. So, talking about those, those, um, those kind of private networks, H3 networks, I think this is where the grid's gonna develop. From that top-down structure I talked about earlier with the generation transmission lines and you just have one point of connection one consumer, and all they do is just absorb energy from the grid. I think towards the future, I think it's going to look more like a, a, a to and fro. You're going to import and export as a customer, and that customer can be residential, that customer can be industrial. Um, it's very much, and that, that becomes more of a mix. So I think uh, across the network, there'll be less strain on the grid because people are doing more storage and more sensible control systems. So you're not just saying, because we've been quite greedy with our energy, we're not just saying, I want power now. You're thinking about how you use power. You're thinking about how you're using the heating. So there is a bit of a sting in the tail with this, which is the second, second big part. Everybody kind of knows about the first bit, but the second, second big part is harmonics. Okay, and this is, we're doing a lot of work on this at the minute um, because Typical generation systems are rotating, rotating devices. They create this nice AC waveform, whereas new systems, both air source heat pumps, PV, wind batteries, you name it, they're switching devices. They're electronic switching devices, which don't go well with those analog waveforms. Okay? So it's something, as we aggregate all these things onto the grid, it's going to become more and more of a problem. And I think this G5 um, the harmonics... Um, standard is going to have to be tightened up for the national grid to control the headache that it's going to, that it's going to be coming. The issue with the harmonics is it, it affects transformers, it stops protection systems from working, um, it's just not brilliant. So, going back to school, the AC waveform that you tend to usually get is that blue one there. Okay, and that comes from a standard kind of generator system that you see on the right hand side. This is one that I installed in Africa years and years ago, or well, not years ago, two years ago. Um, so the, the, kind of, the kind of harmonics that we tend to see are the 3rd, 5th, 7th, all up to 20, 20th harmonics. And what they do is they impose themselves onto the AC waveform. So I could have an air source heat pump in like oh, right over the side of Exeter in the university, keep saying university, and I could have an air source heat pump in the hospital. And the two combined on the HV net, lo local network, 33 kV, kV network, will be an aggregated sum. So all of a sudden, it's the wider community and the grid that are having to deal with this harmonic. So this is part one of the things we have to design, look at, look at within the design of, of, of our systems. So again, the, the benefit of, of, these, um, of using microgrids, these, these kind of private networks, is that you can start to then become a distributor. You can start to get paid from the national grid for the use of your energy, you know, half an hourly support, half an hourly support, things like that. You can also look to support new projects, new homes. I think there's, near the hospital in Cornwall, I think there's a similar project where they're looking at doing something, something like this. Um, so it has a lot of benefits, but the issue is um, looking at the harmonics, how we manage that. And for me, rather than the, the grid, you know, the, the, the supply issue, which I think is well known, I think the harmonics is the bigger issue to come. Uh, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> My mind is slightly blown with this idea that potentially in the future as a business owner or, or, or as a consumer, I may be able to plan and spread my energy consumption yep. the same way as I might do with my, I don't know, or I might have done with my data usage in the past or yep. something like that. Yep, that that's How far away do you think that is? Well, it's happening already now. I mean, it's a, lot of, a lot of domestic users are already starting to do the battery storage systems, selling back to the grid, all this kind of good stuff, and managing their own energy. So anything they don't use, they'll sell back to the grid. But it's not really worth doing that. It's worth keeping it within your own system. And that's where I, I see bigger industrial sites. Um, again, like I, said, I keep saying universities, hospitals, but they're ideal in the way they've got their own HV networks already. And this is an ideal way of managing their own energy. Then anything they don't use, they can put out to the grid and sell back to the grid and provide support to that grid. Um, 
So, yeah. And therefore take energy bills down. At, yeah, exactly. And yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fabulous. Absolutely brilliant. Um, anybody, uh, have we got a question, please, for Phil? Yep, we've got one in the Hello. Thank you. Um, I just, I'm interested because I did a project a few years ago at the National Grid who have this um, problem that the um, feeding in of energy to the grid at a small scale is a kind of wild west and that they have no ability to track what's going on and therefore are constantly having to fight fires um, uh, um, in order to maintain the correct um, voltages and all the rest of it on, on the wider grid. Um, it feels like they're in order to incorporate all of these ideas that you're talking about, it needs some kind of regulatory change to bring that under control. Ab absolutely, and one of the things they, they brought in was the, G, the G99 regulations, which is about regulating small, small mic microgrids and generation onto, onto the network. But like you say, it is still a little bit wild west, and I think this is where we need to, the, the, the structure needs to be a little bit more defined. And I think as designers, we need to be aware that although we've got things like the G5 and the G99, we need to be, designing a lot a lot tighter, a lot finer. Like, for instance, if I'm putting a big system, an inverter system on, on a, a microgrid, I think we need to go back to manufacturers and say, it's not good enough that you've got a certain amount of harmonics sat out there that are just about making, making you know, we've got to be centered, we've got to try and get the best system we can with a, with a minimal amount of harmonics, because we know this is gonna be a problem. We know that, you know, th this is the right thing to do. So yeah, it, it is a bit crazy out there at the moment. I think something that needs to change. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, I've now got the pleasure to hand over to Joe. Um, Joe is the chair of the Southwest Sustainability Committee for the ICAEAW, um, and you're going to talk about carbon accounting. Sure. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Joe Muncaster. I'm a chartered accountant. There we go. Um, I'm going to walk you through carbon accounting and the basics of carbon accounting. We are going to look at what the different requirements are in carbon accounting and how you can start to match your time and resources to cut the carbon accounting options out there. It's a bit hands-on to some of the presentations you've had this morning. Um, so objectives and requirements, why are we doing this? Um, for some of you, it might be a regulatory requirement few people I've spoken to this morning, it's a commercial requirement. Um, so commercial reasons that you might have might be that your customers, your suppliers want to understand what your carbon footprint is. You become part of their scope three value chain. Um, so they need to understand whether how you contribute to their own net zero goals. Um, are your plans consistent with their plans or do you need to up your game a bit so that you can support them to reduce their emissions um, as they go forward? We're also starting to see quite an increase now in tender contracts. So tender contracts are starting to ask, what are you doing to become net zero? How is your, con if I award you this contract, how's that gonna impact my business? Um, and also, one of the key areas that we're starting to see this now are investors. So we'll talk a little bit in a minute about the TCFDs, but investors are now being asked, what's your climate risk of your portfolio? So they want to understand what we're starting to see, those lower incentive costs for more carbon-reduced products and businesses. So you might see um, lower cost mortgages for properties with higher EPCs now. Um, the other two boxes that I've got here are the specific regulations that we currently have in the UK. Um, so the Streamlined Energy Carbon Reporting Guidance, this is part of the Companies Act. Um, it applies to all large companies with an annual energy use that exceeds 40 megawatt hours. This requires you to report your scope one, so fuel usage. That's kind of vague, but <laughs> we'll keep it at that for now. Um, electricity usage, so that's your scope two. And then business travel, which is one of the categories of your scope three. It also requires you to report on a KPI, so that shows how the relationship between your carbon emissions and business activities um, 
So that could be your carbon emissions by million pounds of turnover, or it could be your carbon emissions by the amount of kilos of product that you sold that year. That's to enable you to do an industry comparison. So you can go to company, anyone here could go to company's house, download the financial statements of a large company, and within those financial statements, you will find the statement of their scope one, two, bit of three, carbon footprint, and also that KPI. So you can then compare them to other industry businesses from those financial statements. Um, also under the SECR, um, companies are required to disclose what they're doing to reduce their carbon emissions. Um, in practice, that can be very wildly in quality. I've seen financial statements where people say, we've not done anything this year. <laughs> Or you might see uh, financial statements where companies reel off pages and pages of what they're doing, but actually it doesn't require them to match that to any of those scope emissions. So they might say, uh, we've reduced single-use plastic in our business, but actually how does that impact your carbon emissions? How is that impacting your carbon footprint? How is that helping you to get to net zero? Those are the kind of things that people need to be quantifying and thinking about. Finally, we've got the TCFDs, or the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures recommendations. This is looking at how, does, how is climate change going to impact my business? So what are those risks that I need to think about? Um, they include all of the elements of the SECR carbon footprint, but also the other 14 categories of carbon emissions that you see in scope three. Um, so that includes products and services purchases, that could be your employee commuting, that could be remote working, investments, freight to and from your business, even down to how your customers use your products. So if you're Dyson, that includes the electricity that to run a hoover that you've made for its lifetime and the disposal of that hoover at the end of its lifetime. So you can see why companies are really starting to ask a lot more questions around the carbon emissions and their supply chain carbon emissions. So what do you need to start thinking about? Um, you need to consider, has anyone in your business already set a net zero target? Someone might have uh, done it in marketing without any consultation. So you need to think about Who's going to be interested in that? Are your clients going to be interested, your employees, your customers? Um, and then also, is there a reputational risk? If you set yourself a target of 2030, 2050, and you don't make it, what's that impact going to be? Is there a financial risk to this? If your bank wants to understand what your net zero target is and you're not making that progress, is that going to start impacting your investments? Everyone knows the greenwashing stories. Um, the media can be uncompromising. Um, you need to consider, are you being transparent enough? No one thinks that getting to net zero is going to be easy. Um, now is the time to recognize those biggest challenges and really consider what strategy you're going to take to mitigate and manage them. And don't be shy about it. Considerations for doing your carbon footprint then need to include the time frame that you're looking at. Ideally, you want to match, well, you need to match this with your accounting periods, um, but it might be that you want to do it quarterly, biannually. Um, and then also that longevity piece. So this isn't going to be a one-off process. Um, you need to be doing this regularly. So is it worth building those skills in-house or funding a tool that you can integrate with your existing reporting contract? Um, remember, those baseline calculations are just your starting point. Uh, finally, planning your resources, so I've split this into four steps, looking at your baseline, thinking about your reductions, data collection, and then budgeting. So for calculating your carbon footprint, there are some really great tools out there already. Um, one of my favorites is the SME Climate Hub, so here you can get a free carbon footprint with the normative tool. Um, they also give you access to many other resources that you can use. Uh, you could outsource, use a consultant, get someone in, or you could consider upskilling. Um, so the GHG protocol, as an accountant, I think it's very reason readable. Um, <laughs> other people might disagree. Um, but, and then every year, the UK government releases greenhouse gas conversion rates. So that will tell you 
per mile, what is the carb CO2 equivalent um, emission for driving my car a kilometer? Um, so you can use that to calculate that yourself. Next, you want to consider your reduction options. So what sort of budget are you potentially able to allocate this? Uh, do you need to increase the knowledge of your whole staff so they can make more informed decisions? Is it time to start asking your suppliers if they're monitoring their emissions or have net zero plans? Ultimately, you need to get management buy-in because without that, you probably won't have a budget. So how do you measure their commitment? Does it come through that budget or is it KPIs at a company level? Um, a key element of this then is data collection. So how are you going to monitor where those data carbon emissions are coming from? And for me, this is really where finance really steps in because unfortunately finance is a cornerstone of all decision making in your company. Um, so this touch point really gives you the opportunity to record and monitor that decision making. It could be something to start with that is as little as an additional line on a purchase order form. What is the carbon emissions of this purchase to get people starting to think about it? Um, I also mentioned before carbon, carbon accounting software. So um, Sage have just purchased Spherix, which is a Bristol-based company. SAP are working on their carbon emission calculations. The Carbon Trust has a cloud-based tool. Sustrax does one online as well. And I've already mentioned Normative on the SME Climate Hub. So those are just a few of the examples out there of softwares that are already being developed. Um, and then my last point here is that you need to start setting targets, looking at incentives, working out how are you going to monitor your progress there um, and how regularly are you going to report on this. Do you need something like an internal carbon tax that really incentivizes and levers better decision making? That's quite a lot to think about. Um, hopefully it's some practical advice there that you can take away. Um, if you want any more detail, please don't hesitate to grab me later. Thanks. There's a huge amount in there, isn't there? Because, you know, if you're, if you're a, 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 and in the southwest, we've got a lot of small, small businesses. Actually, there's quite a lot in there to digest. Those links that you talked about a few minutes ago, can we grab those off Absolutely. you? And maybe we'll share them on LinkedIn and share them with, the, with, the, with them, everybody who's signed up, because I think there's probably some nuggets in there mm -hmm. that if people have to go and find themselves, that they might struggle with. Um, if you had one tip for a, a, a small business, um, what, what would be the one tip you'd give them in terms of, right, you, you've not done anything so far, um, where do you start? Go to the SME Climate Hub. Yeah. So it's endorsed and um, paid for by the UN and the UK government. It's free. Um, I just think it's a great place to start. Okay, brilliant. Lovely. Have we got a question for Joe? Steve's got a question for Joe. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Really, really informative. Um, now, more and more of us are looking at things like hybrid working, working from home being established. Presumably in this type of model, not only are we going to need to calculate the cost of running our offices, but also ultimately the cost of our employees working from home as well. Is that, is that a correct assumption? Absolutely. Um, and the normative tool does calculate that for you. So you can say how many people you've got working from home. Interestingly, um, in the company I worked at, we did an internal survey. So we just did like a kind of survey monkey, Google Forms. Um, and we were lower than the average. So I think it really depends on how cognitive or tight-fisted your staff are as to how, how much they're running their heating at home additionally, um, how many extra monitors they've got, computers, all the rest of it, and starting to think about kind of the impact that that has. I know I saw a um, company, who is it because I'm standing on that? Um, the co a company recently that started to monitor um, the difference between having online meetings versus if they had met in person and measuring that saved carbon emissions cost, which I thought was really fascinating. So they could start to demonstrate to their own employees and their um, suppliers and customers, actually the impact that they were having by substituting in-person meetings with uh, virtual meetings, 
which I know isn't always everyone's preference, um, but I think if you can show that value, that's really valuable. Yeah, and that's the additional insight, isn't it, that it mm. provides and then helps the decision making. Yeah. So it's moving in the right direction. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we round of applause for Jeff? So now we're going to hand over to Johanna and to Dave. And, and um, Johanna and Dave are going to share with us some practical steps that we can take in our businesses as we head on this, on this journey. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to do a bit of a double act, try not to trip each other up. Um, and we um, are from Clearly Consulting. Um, I'm going to uh, get the clicker. Okay, so we're going to talk to you a little bit about some practical net zero business applications. Um, so I'm going to give a little introduction to who we are um, and talk a little bit about what I do, which is um, looking more broadly at sustainability strategies um, and how we embed the net zero strategies into thinking about sustainability more holistically. Um, I'll then hand over to my colleague Dave, who will talk a little bit about some practical business applications. So giving some examples of uh, people that we've supported, that we've worked with to help move their net zero strategies forward and different challenges that we've come across um, working with um, various different organisations. And then, um, with time allows, we'll leave you with a few kind of uh, uh, key thoughts, um, challenges, um, things to be aware of. So who we are, um, we are a, well, we're a small um, startup company. We're very similar to DigiLab in the way that we, we started. We, we'd met kind of 10, 15 years ago, thought we, we're good at this stuff. Um, we want to do this in the Southwest. Um, so we came together with an idea that there was an opportunity out there um, to provide support for um, businesses in their carbon management journey and their sustainability journeys. Um, and we grew um, more slowly than DigiLab, um, but we grew um, to 17 staff um, from uh, the three of us um, getting together um, and um, really worked in energy, carbon management, sustainability management and environmental management and compliance. Um, working with a mix of people, um, commercial and public sector, so a whole range of, of different organisations with different challenges. Um, we're based just outside of the, um, the, the city in um, Ottery, St. Mary, um, a lovely Cad Hay House. For those of you who haven't been, I would recommend it. It's beautiful. Um, and then recently, we have merged with a, a bigger organisation, um, SLR Consulting. And that was because we were just so busy. We were struggling to kind of resource the demands. Um, we were struggling to get enough people in to support us. So. We now have a team of 70 people um, rather than 17, which is great for us. It, it's bringing more opportunities um, and, and more ideas um, and more access to some, some great, great projects to work on. So um, sorts of things that we do. Um, so we, we work um, on a whole range of things and we, we very much tailor what we do um, to help people support, to support people wherever they are on their journey. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but we, we work with um, setting strategies, uh, reporting um, and ESG disclosures, um, obviously carbon um, and net zero. Um, we work um, helping people um, define and um, improve their societal and community impacts. Um, we do a lot of engagement, um, stakeholder analysis and communications, and, and a lot of assurance and veri verification. And really, this, is, this slide's quite helpful in kind of setting out kind of how we work um, with different organizations. So we, we, we sort of twin, twin track um, our carbon and ESG support approach. So we, we start off looking at, at kind of what the companies are doing um, themselves and, and what their peers are doing and working with um, organizations to understand what's important um, in terms of sustainability. So what's material to the company? Where, where does the focus need to be? And quite often, um, in most cases, carbon is one of those things, um, but it, it, we find it's important to consider that in the round with other um, sustainability aspects. So looking at your societal impacts, looking at biodiversity. Um, 
And then we move on to developing a strategy um, and implementation road, roadmap. So understanding what stakeholder expectations are, looking at gaps, looking at opportunities, um, and setting out a clear strategy um, and ambition um, for the company. Now, quite often, um, you know, we're not coming to this, you know, with a blank sheet of paper. Um, often companies have already, uh, you know, are down their journey. So we, you know, they're perhaps focusing on, on carbon. So we embed that into the wider strategy and we, and we look at twin tracking the work on, on carbon and, and net zero aspirations into the wider sustainability work. So this is just a few examples of, of how that can be um, communicated um, and how important it is to have a clear articulation of the priority and am ambitions for the company. So we undertake what's called a materiality assessment, so looking at um, what the future risks and opportunities might be, um, how to engage um, both internally and externally. So um, often a lot of the work that we do is, is supporting companies with training and awareness raising um, within their organization. So um, it's making it relevant to the individuals who are an, an employees. So they can actually see what the company is trying to achieve to make it relevant to them sort of personally and professionally or to their teams so they can actually get invested um, and, and it helps with behavioural change um, and helps people engage with what the company is trying to do. Um, we also sort of help with setting up um, uh, sustainability champions groups um, and mentors to, to get the, um, the strategy embedded within the company. So, um, moving on to give Dave a bit of time to talk about some of the practical applications um, of some of the work that we've done with some of the um, some of our clients. Good morning, every, everybody. Thank you very much. Three minutes, 33 seconds to go, Joe. Come on, that's not fair. I was supposed to be half of this session. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, I'll, I'll whiz through some of these. A lot of these points I'm going to bring up here uh, build on what Joe said just five minutes ago. I'm going to hopefully put a little bit more detail on. Uh, the steps we've got here, the five steps, are very similar to the few steps that Joe put up. Again, I won't build on them, but somebody needs to... I think this touches on what Karim said. Just do something. Don't just sit and talk about should we do something. Actually do something, yeah? And whether it's one of these things, just make a start and do something, please. Next slide. So... One of the big elephants in the room is scope three. Joe touched on this uh, a moment ago. This is one of our uh, property, it's a, it's a massive, massive uh, UK PLC company we work for. And you can see their scope three um, here is absolutely ginormous. And they're worried about this little bit down here. But in terms of materiality, this is the materiality assessment that this Joe talked about a moment ago. You, know, you can focus on your scope one and scope two, but if in fact scope three is massive, almost it doesn't really matter about your scope one and scope two. You need to get to grip with what is material for your organisation. Next slide, please, Joe. Uh, this is a breakdown of that. And again, there's, other, there's so many Joes. And they're both Joe M's, aren't they? Joe M, Joe M, the blonde Joe, Joe with glasses. Sorry about this. Um, but you can see there is 15 separate categories within scope three. And it was very useful to this organization. This is their scope three. We did this deep dive to quantify which slice within those 15 subsections is their material bit that they need to focus on. Because we're all crazy busy. We don't know what to do. Let's focus on the things that we need to focus on. Okay, thank you. What we try to do is help clients come up with a, a kind of a path where we need to go. A lot of people have set, set themselves a, a target of here with no comprehension of how the hell to get there, but at least make a start. Let's say, okay, that's where we want to go. We've decided that, okay, where are we now? If we don't do anything else, we're going to end up here, which is way off where we want to be. So we need to do something. This is just the 2030 net zero piece. But by 2050, next slide, please, Joe. 
In fact, it's going to be down here. Oh, my goodness. So we just need to get on and do stuff, yeah? The challenge for everybody, I've been doing this stuff for 30 years, and I'm still uh, in awe at how much we need to do, yeah? And what we don't know, but we just need to do something. This is what we need to do. And even when we've got to here, or the previous point on the last slide, we've still got these residual emissions that we need to deal with. So as a part of reducing our emissions, whether it's in scope one or scope two or scope three, we still need to work away in the background. And we're still, for net zero, going to have to deal with these residual emissions. Next slide, please. So you need to have some kind of offsetting strategy to sit alongside your net zero strategy as well. And there's a lot of different offsetting things that you can do to try and help with that um, residual bit that you're going to have to deal with. A lot of these offsetting bits to deal with the residual bits have a long lead time, 10, 20, 30, 40 years before they start delivering. So even though you might not need this bit until 2050, you need to start thinking about that now as a part of your net zero. I was going to say, I've got another extra minute and a half. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. So think about this. This is the, a piece of work we've done for a very um, well-known uh, Devon-based organization. We looked at all the different offsetting strategies that they could knit in to their net zero approach. And we as clearly we've planted about 1,000 trees in our local woodland on the Cadet Estate, which is fascinating because every February we go into the woods and we measure the circumference of all the trees that we've planted. And since 2017, I think we've sequestered 10, no, I think it's 100 kilograms of carbon in five years from 1,000 trees. You know, it's just, yeah, sorry. I'm, I love this, I'm very passionate, but we just need to get on and do a lot, lot more of everything that we want to do. Shall we skip this one? Yeah, okay. Go on to the next one and the next one. Do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, so um, this is just a piece of work that we were doing this furniture retail company. Um, and as part of their strategy, um, they wanted to um, run their scope three workshop. Um, and probably just the main thing um, that we found really interesting was we, we ran the initial workshop and um, in order to explain to them what we were doing, we gave them an example um, of a scope three um, carbon footprint um, from Nestle. And they all sat back in their chairs and went, oh, well, that's very interesting. That explains a few things. And we, we hadn't realized that, they, that one of their main clients was Nestle. Um, they supply furniture to them. And they looked at Nestle's scope three and realized they didn't really feature on that. Nestle's scope three is all about their ingredients. Um, so actually, by understanding that, they understood the motiva motivations of their customers. And they also appreciated that actually for some of their other customers, they would be a bigger part of their scope three. And actually, that's probably where they needed to focus their efforts in communicating what they were doing. So it was quite interesting um, in terms of understanding their position and their relationship um, with another organization. We're in the red. <laughs> so um, just last slide. So this is just um, a few sort of last thoughts on um, some of the opportunities and challenges that we've identified. Um, so sort of going back to the initial point about strategic framing, um, it can take all shapes and forms, but it's important to articulate the priority ambitions um, to help integrate what you're doing in terms of net zero. So you don't um, miss things or you don't inadvertently um, have a negative impact on something else um, through um, advancing your, your um, net zero ambition. You may have a negative impact on biodiversity or on water, water consumption those sorts of things. Um, you can break down steps, as Dave's talked about, um, understanding where your emissions originate from, um, and targeting um, certain aspects. Um, it's important to think about the whole approach, as Dave said. Um, you don't want to be relying on expensive um, offsets. I think that's supposed to be expensive, not inexpensive. <laughs> but, um, so, but it's important to, to think about the whole picture and your strategy to get to the end point. Um, Joe mentioned greenwashing earlier. Um, we've seen a lot of this. Um, people are very keen to kind of communicate um, what they're doing, but it's important to do that with, with science behind it. 
Um, and ultimately, net zero won't be achieved by individuals, organisations or governments alone. We all need to work together. And that, that point about um, people's scope threes and how they relate to each other um, is, is very important to understand because it helps target and focus your efforts. I think the, the key message there is, is it's not just about the scope that you've got in your organisation or what you might be doing, it's where you sit in the supply chain and actually how that might impact and come downstream to you at a point in the future. So, uh, as Karima said, and I think we've heard throughout, it is about taking action now, starting somewhere and actually driving it forward. Have we got any questions for the team at Clearly? Hi there. Um, so, so the more I learn about um, off offsetting schemes, <coughs> the more sceptical I become. They seem to have a, a lot of... Very wise. <laughs> a lot yeah. of uh, holes and gaps, and in many cases seem purely uh, counterproductive. Yes. Um, what's the... Uh, is there any net benefit to offsetting at all? Are there, should we trust uh, uh, Offsetting, you know, in the Paris Agreement, you know, the whole concept of offsetting is embedded in the Paris Agreement. We are all allowed to do offsetting and it is a recognition that we can't, we need to use energy and carbon to exist as, you know, as a society. We can squeeze it right the way down, but there will this be this almost impossible bit at the bottom that we can't squish down. So that is where offsetting needs to fit. Offsetting is a wild, a wild rest at the moment and it will be. There was a thing on the BBC, was it last week? About all the, a lot of these offsets in particularly you know, jungles and things like that. It's complete fabrication. It's complete fabrication. And so please beware of where you particularly put money or thinking. But because if you want to go into trees or peat bogs or some of the others I put on there, they're very, very long lead time solutions. Don't wait until 2029 to do your residual offsets for 2030 because either they'll be prohibitively expensive or just not available. The sooner we start having a strategy to deal with those residual emissions alongside all your emission reduction stuff in your scope one, two, and three, the better, because they, they do need to run in parallel. They do need to uh, link together at the end, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a minefield out there, so tread carefully. But everybody needs to have that as a part of the uh, Everybody's solution is going to have to have a bit of that. We just need to get better and get more confident in what are the good bits here. But watch out for all the snake oil salesmen out there. There's a lot of them. Brilliant. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Um, Fraser, last but by no means least. Um, so Fraser joins us from the University of Exeter. Um, Fraser, it's fair to say you're responsible for all of the, uh, the plans of the university for offsetting. <laughs> All of them? Yeah. I'm involved with the plans and development. You are involved with the plans, and you're going to share some of your experience and what you do to support businesses. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Over thank to you. you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you to Exist for having me here. I think if I drop forward, there we go. So uh, my name is Fraser Browning. I'm the technical evaluator at the University of Exeter. I look after our scope 3 decarbonisation our carbon accounting, which has been touched on uh, today, but also our technical carbon evaluation processes for feeding uh, sustainability generally uh, as a metric within to our decision making at the university. I am also director of Curb, an exciting uh, and fresh uh, startup looking at empowering project managers via a series of uh, SaaS platforms to evaluate their own projects. Uh, but as I said, I am here today to talk about the University of Exeter's approach to net zero. So to kick that off, I think it's useful to, to talk initially about what we're seeking to achieve within our net zero strategy. So the University of Exeter are looking to uh, achieve net zero status across scope one, scope two, and scope three by 2030. So we've got quite ambitious targets uh, in this space. But what that's allowed us to do is to look at what our target trajectory on an annual basis looks like from our 2018-19 baseline year up to that um, up to that year, 29.30 for us, uh, by, which, uh, by which point we're going to be net zero. So what does this actually mean? I apologize, there's a lot of text on this slide, uh, but I think it is important to understand 
the terminology when you're seeking to um, put these targets into place. Um, so uh, there's two terms that tend to be thrown around when we're looking at sustainability targets um, on greenhouse gas emissions. So carbon neutral is the balancing of greenhouse gas emissions such that the same quantity of emissions within a given system are offset as emitted. And, um, because the system is open to definition, this means it can be applied only to scope one two, and two emissions as it typically is, and not the whole scope one, two, and three. And that means that we can't guarantee that if everybody was to use carbon neutrality as a, uh, as a method of targeting greenhouse gas emissions, we couldn't guarantee a global temperature rise of less than the 1.5 degrees per year that's set in the 2015 Paris Agreement. So the University of Exeter have chosen to target net zero, which is similar, but there are some key differences. So this is an operating status defined by significant reduction of greenhouse gas emissions up front first before considering residual carbon management and it caters for scope one, scope two, and scope three to get a complete, um, uh, a complete view of the impact of a given organization. And this means you get far greater confidence in maintaining that global temperature rise to less than 1.5 degrees as set out in that 2015 Paris Agreement. So a couple of other terms that have been mentioned a lot, so I won't, I won't dive right into this, but scope one, scope two, and scope three, what do we mean by these categories of emissions? This is a diagram that I think is really helpful for communicating this. It's straight out of the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, so scope one is your, your direct emissions that come from fuel consumption on site. Scope two, scope two is very often grouped together with scope one because of its connection to energy. Again, that's your purchased electricity because the emissions are actually generated off site. It's seen as indirect again. And scope three is all your other indirect emissions that arise from your operations and your supply chain, both upstream and downstream. Um, and I think the important thing from a business perspective with this model is that aside from your own sustainability objectives, your emissions that you generate from your operations and your manufacturing and everything, they feed into your customers' um, greenhouse gas emissions footprint. And so there's a commercial reason to get familiar with this terminology to, to understand what that means for your customers because there is both risk and opportunity associated with that. So how are we doing it at the University of Exeter? So what we've done is using uh, industry expertise, but also the academic community that we're fortunate enough to have uh, at the University of Exeter. We've broken down our journey into a five-step journey to net zero. So we've started out with building the foundations. This kicked off in 2018-19. Uh, and this was all around uh, a lot of the concepts actually have been touched on today around getting a team in place, identifying the responsibilities for sustainability across our organization, and working on our data processes to make sure we've got a good understanding of where our impact actually sits, um, but also how we're going to monitor that impact going forward so that we can demonstrate the climate action we've got um, coming in later steps, but also so that we can learn from the initiatives we're putting in place. We've moved now into stage two, which is the operational carbon reduction, which is all around applying the carbon hierarchy to our operations to find opportunities to reduce the impact of those high impact areas. Whole life carbon accounting, again, has been touched on by, um, by Joe and Clearlead. Uh, but for us, this is about building on those data processes we built in that initial stage. And whilst um, acting on our high impact areas, we want to improve the accuracy by which we monitor our greenhouse gas emissions and sustainability metrics more generally, moving away from spend-based methodologies and engaging with our supply chain to get accurate information uh, on those elements. Stage four is also being acted on an early stage now. Um, we're developing the plans for that at PACE. Um, and that's all around residual carbon management and offsetting. There's a huge amount of risk, particularly reputational risk, around what we choose to do with our residual carbon. Um, so we're working hard again with industry and with our academic community to understand what best practice means in the offsetting space. And then the final stage, step five, is one I often see missed off net zero frameworks. But I think it is really important for organizations to consider. Um, and that's what net zero looks like as business as usual. I think very often we see net zero perhaps as a static finish line, and that's, that's absolutely not the case. Um, particularly when we look at scope three, there are going to be significant changes to the way we operate, and they need to be maintained going forward. But also, what do our targets look like? Our targets from 2030 will switch from net zero targets through to our offsetting contribution and reducing that offsetting contribution target um, down, uh, down and down up to, up to 2050, where we're looking at a 90 95% contribution is the target there. So I mentioned that we've, we're focusing at the moment on step two with some consideration for those later steps on the operational carbon reduction. 
to how we're doing that. So as I said, our net zero target covers scopes one and two and scope three, and the challenges associated with those two groups of greenhouse gas emissions are very different. So what we've actually done is develop two separate strategies to handle those, but making sure that there is a connection between the two because there, there is a big interconnection to consider. So for scopes one and two, we've developed what's called our infrastructure decarbonisation master plan, uh, and that seeks to uh, improve the energy efficiency of our building stock to electrify our state towards technologies like uh, heat pumps, to uh, ramp up our renewable energy generation to, uh, to handle the energy use on site. We're looking at how we use those assets. I think we can all relate to the fact that certainly post-COVID, the, the way we operate within our building spaces is completely different uh, to, to pre-COVID time. And so there's actually opportunities there to, to use our assets in a far more efficient way to not only save on the energy use with our current building stock, but also to limit the need to grow our estate as our uh, activities grow over time, all the while applying the carbon hierarchy to each of those points. On the scope three side, it's much more around embedding cultural and behavioral change into operations, uh, how and why do we travel, how and why do we purchase. Again, applying the carbon hierarchy at every decision um, that we can within the university, achieving the, ne the necessary management and stakeholder buy-in uh, on this, and then also uh, supply chain engagement we can't achieve our net zero targets without supporting our supply chain to decarbonize themselves. So there's huge efforts uh, at the university to look at our supply chain, particularly high impact areas of our supply chain, and support them uh, as we move towards 2030. I just want to touch on one specific difference in challenges between these two strategies. And it's, it's a cliche, but it is something that often comes up that financing is a major challenge to both of these. But the challenges associated with financing these two strategies are very different. For scopes one and two, it's often very high value capital expenditure. Things like improving the fabric of our buildings that has high cost associated with it, but it can be capitalized. The flip side on scope three, it's often, it's often low, low to medium, depending on which area of scope three you're looking at, value, but it tends to be revenue expenditure, which means it's gonna hit the bottom line. It has a completely separate challenge. It also means that opportunities to finance certain initiatives within scope three aren't available like they are for scope one and two. So it is important to, un to just to understand that, that difference as you start to look at financing whatever strategy gets put in place. And then finally, um, I just wanted to touch on, um, as I said, I've got two hats. I work with the university, but I do work a lot with business. And I wanted to touch on where the major consistent challenges are. And these have been mentioned a lot today. So um, just in terms of, of three take homes, really, it's really important to understand where the responsibility and accountability for sustainability and ESG sits within your organization. And a lot of the time, there are existing governance structures that can be used for that. You don't have to set up, and actually sometimes it's better not to set up a siloed sustainability governance channel, something like that. Target your high impact areas, use your data to inform your sustainability and ESG strategies and target those areas of high impact areas. Taking generic uh, strategies or generic frameworks aren't always appropriate depending on what company or organization you're part of. And then consider your business context. Um, as I said before, the scope three model means that you contribute to your customers' uh, emissions. Sorry, I almost stood on something. Um, uh, so, so consider what that means for your strategy. Are there opportunities arising? Um, uh, there was a piece of work I'm working on where um, somebody mentioned recently what, what opportunities arise from a net zero economy for your business. It doesn't have to just be risk. There are real positives coming out of this net zero journey and it's important to consider what they are. The one final thing, I'm sorry, I know I'm slightly over, the one final thing I want to mention is that our Innovation Impact and Business um, Department at the University of Exeter uh, have a lot of uh, support uh, channels for organizations looking to de-risk net zero via innovation. Um, what I'll try and do is get the contact details for that added to these slides if they get circulated, but please do get in touch if that's, what, if that's relevant to your business organization, that'd be great. talked about working across businesses and, and obviously you, the, the university is a, a big organization with a lot of support behind it or a lot of, of resources within there. What, what, as you were at engaging with businesses, what do you think is, is the single most important thing that businesses are doing as they start this journey? Uh, I, think, I think there are two things. I think understanding where the responsibility sits is really important, something that often gets overlooked. I think that's the first one. But the other thing, and it's been mentioned already, is target... The, the first, the first thing really is, is to get to know where your high impact areas are. Yeah. Don't make assumptions or presumptions on where your areas of impact might be. When I've worked with businesses, there have been some real surprises that come out early stage. And you, 
it is, it's, sustainability in ESG is becoming so broad, it's easy, particularly for SMEs, to spend significant resource going down an area that might be viewed as a generic high area of impact and actually isn't for your specific business organization. So get to know where those high impact areas are, make use of free resources like the SME Climate Hub that Joe mentioned earlier, um, uh, and then target those areas first. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's, it's, it's what we do in business every day is what gets measured gets done. And understanding the numbers and the data, you know, going back to, to Tim earlier on, it, you know, it might be at a, at a different level because you talk about, you know, the, the solar across all of all of the city of Exeter, yeah. but actually you've got to start by measuring, setting some targets, setting accountability, and then and then one step after the other from there. I think the other thing I'll just add to that as well is that I think sustainability is sometimes viewed as an additional task that needs to be added, which has negatives with regard to resource yeah. allocation. And we're moving to a time now where that really doesn't have to be the case. You can embed it into, if you do this early enough, you embed it into your business operations, the impact to your business and disruption of business doesn't have to be significant. And the opportunities that are arising yeah. in this space are really starting to outweigh the negatives on this side. Easy for me to say as someone who's got business in that zero, but the evidence is there and yeah. it, that is true. Brilliant, brilliant. And that, well, that's what events like this are about. It's about surfacing this information, the opportunity that sits there and looking yeah. at it through a very positive lens so we're moving towards it rather than moving away from something else, which is, which is an important aspect to it. Have we got any questions for Fraser? Let's go Steve again. Thanks, Steve. Thank you for that. Um, we've heard in the last two presentations about offsetting, and you were really clear that that's an almost inevitable part of a, a, a net zero strategy. Um, as businesses, we've equally heard snake oil sales and how, how, how do you accredit or how do you know that the offsetting route that you're taking as a business is is valid is viable so that's a really good question i think the honest answer for us as a university at the moment is that we don't but as kareen mentioned at the beginning in his talk we don't see that as a reason not to 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 engage with it we are we are taking a lot of time to take on information from our academic community and from industry experts to give the greatest confidence that we can that the routes that we're going down are the right way. External verification can help with that. I think transparency has been mentioned a lot in this and I think that's one of the things that's missing in offsets at the moment and I think from my experience working with, with some offset schemes or looking into certain offset schemes, if an offset scheme is particularly reluctant to give up the information associated with it, I see that as a major alarm bell. Companies that want to be transparent are actually um, Tim and Digilab touched on this as well, where if you can give confidence in one of your many options, that can help. We're going to have to track this over time. It, it's quite a new concept, I think, still offsetting, and I, we're going to have to learn lessons. Uh, but as, as I said, it's not a reason not to, to go down those routes, so long as we put measures in place that allow us to learn those lessons. But the honest answer to your question is we don't at the moment. Uh, come back to us five to ten years, and maybe we'll have a more complete answer on that. <laughs> And I think it's clear we don't use that as an excuse not to do it. No, it's not. We've got, we've got to not. start. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah, very much. Yeah. Um, I'm going to wind us up there. I, I think everybody will agree. Fabulous set of, of speakers, really diverse range of, of, of um, topics that we've covered in our first um, Exist event focusing on net zero. Um, thank you so much to you guys in the audience uh, for coming along this morning and taking the time to be with us. Um, our next event is in June. We'll be holding that in the Science Park. Um, and that will be looking at the circular economy again in the, in the theme of, of net zero. Um, so just um, thank you so much to our speakers. Really, really diverse set of, of conversations. I think we started the conversation and started the discussion with people. Um, I know you guys have